Hello everyone, this is Sarah from Hamilton. This is part three of a many part series of videos where Michael Garten and myself respond in detail to Gavin Ortland's contention that the creation and veneration of icons is a late development in church history without legitimate foundation in the faith of the early church. This video surveys evidence from a variety of channels ranging from archaeological, epigraphic, and manuscript evidence of the Antinician Church to the attestation of post nicene authors to pre nicene practice. If you are interested in supporting the work of this channel on this and other matters, please consider becoming a patron, which allows me to continue investing time and energy in producing original content of high quality. Through the links in the pinned comment, you can also purchase my two recorded courses, Answering Protestantism from the Bible and Answering Calvinism from the Bible, which collectively make up 24 hours of content responding in detail to Protestant theology on exegetical and biblical grounds, making the case that the Bible and Orthodox tradition are in perfect harmony on subjects like justification, theosis, the veneration of saints, and many others. You can purchase these courses individually or bundled together for a discount. Also in the pinned comment is Michael Garten's Substack, which offers premium content on iconography and other subjects. Please consider supporting Michael in this ongoing project, which will eventually result in a book to be published on Amazon. With all of that said, I hope you enjoy this video. And now I'm going to take a look at post-325 AD attestation. Um, my first example of an author writing from around or before, shortly after the time of the Council of Nicaea is, of course, Eusebius of Caesarea. And um, he speaks of memorials of the kindness of the Savior, which were erected by the woman with the issue of blood. Um, and uh, these memorials include um, two basically statues, two, I believe both of them are bronze statues, uh, one of a woman kneeling with her hand stretched out as if she were praying. The other, an image of an upright man made of the same material, clothed decently in a double cloak and extending his hand toward the woman. And at the feet of the statue is a certain strange plant, which is said to um, heal diseases. Um, and he says, they say this statue is an image of Jesus. It has remained to our day so that we ourselves also saw it when we were staying in the city. Now, this statue is described as a memorial, and Eusebius highlights its preservation as salient. So he's talking about its memorial status in multiple ways at multiple times. Memorials are, of course, visited to commemorate or honor what is memorialized. Given that the woman, being an image of piety here, is kneeling, and given that it is difficult to explain why people would be aware of the healing plant um, if they weren't kneeling down, it is... Fairly likely, it makes sense to say that people were kneeling towards the statue of Christ. Um, but even if you set that aside, the fact that this is highlighted as a memorial is itself acknowledgement of its status as an, an image that would be honored by means of visitation, commemoration, that would be a kind of focus of remembrance for people and something they would gather around. So here the commemoration or honor given to the memorial, the image, passes to the prototype, Christ the healer. And we have veneration by commemoration going on here, and possibly veneration by having a prayer stance as well of kneeling. Um, there's a, a passage immediately after this in Eusebius' church history where he says, um, he speaks about um, a practice stretching backwards in time for a kind of unspecified distance, but apparently back to the apostles. Um, and he describes it as follows. Nor is it strange that those of the Gentiles who of old were benefited by our Savior should have done such things, since we have learned also that the likenesses of his apostles Paul and Peter, and of Christ himself, are preserved in paintings, the ancients being accustomed, as it is likely, according to habit of the Gentiles, to pay this kind of honor indiscriminately to those regarded by them as deliverers. Now, with this example, he seems to be describing a tradition of portraiture, specifically portrait art stretching back towards apostolic times and connected to the paying of honor to the person who's being depicted. Now, I'll get more into um, the specific uh, principles that these two scholars enunciate, but Robin Jensen um, mar marks an important connection between portraiture and devotional use of an image. Um, and Jas Elsner uh, is another scholar who connects portraiture very strongly to um, acts of honor in the Greco-Roman context. Uh, we also have examples of times where um, 
portraiture is being honored in um, the memory of uh, of Christianity. Now, these examples, the Acts of John and St. Irenaeus, his notes on the Carpocratians are, of course, from enemy sources, but it still is showing some sort of a connection between portraiture and acts of honor. Um, which corroborates the things that we see in the Greco-Roman context. And um, yeah. Uh, and so here we have um, veneration implied of an unspecified sort, possibly based on similar, um, based on the use of similar kinds of images, namely portraiture. Um, we may have here a reference in Eusebius to bowing, crowning, lighting candles, or the Oran stance directed towards these portraits of Christ and the apostles. We also have uh, in Eusebius, in his life of Constantine, um, the following quote, and I've cut some of this out for the sake of brevity, but it says, Constantine determined to purge idolatry of every kind, that henceforth no statues might be worshipped there in the temples of those falsely reputed to be gods, nor any altars defiled by the pollution of blood. On the other hand, one might see the fountains in the midst of the marketplace graced with figures representing the Good Shepherd, well known to those who study the sacred oracles, and that of Daniel also with the lions. Indeed, so large a measure of divine love possessed the emperor's soul that in the principal apartment of the imperial palace itself, and a vast tablet displayed in the center of its gold-covered paneled ceiling, he caused the symbol of our Savior's passion to be fixed, composed of a variety of precious stones, richly inwrought with gold. This symbol he seemed to have intended to be, as it were, the safeguard of the empire itself. So here we have um, uh, what may be cases of further veneration by commemoration, the Good Shepherd and Daniel in the lion's den. But even setting those aside and setting aside the question of whether or not those are images that are meant to be memorials, although it seems fairly clear that they are. Um, we have here um, St. Constantine placing uh, a bejeweled image, uh, a bejeweled golden cross uh, in the dome uh, of the Imperial Palace. And so this is a case of exalting the cross, lifting it high up um, and adorning it to venerate it. There are also other references um, in basically the lives of various uh, saints um, that were written after uh, 325 AD, but which attest to things that happened to pre-325 AD saints. So in the martyrdom of St. Procopius, you have reference to uh, an image, a central image of Christ, and then side images of Gabriel and Michael being venerated. Obviously, the word worshipped here is... Um, is kind of an English anachronism, and we can get into uh, why that word is ambiguous between what we actually mean by worship and what we mean by veneration. We can get into that in a later video, but uh, those who, um, you know, most people will probably be familiar with the fact that that word is kind of a little bit fluid and flexible. Uh, we also have in St. Sophronius of Jerusalem's Miracles of Cyrus, uh, St. Cyrus and John, uh, we have the martyrs Cyrus and John, who stood before the icon and fell down on the knees before the master, touching the ground with their heads, interceding for the healing of the young man. Um, and then in the lives of St. Hipparchus and Philotheos, which I believe died before 325 AD, but I'll need to you know, completely confirm this. Uh, we have this reference. They had made an image of the cross Sorry, before. Would, um, the dates on um, 304 to 311, is that for... Um, St. Sophronius, or is that for the St. Cyrus and John? Yeah, yeah uh, yes, a uh, death date. Uh, so approximately 303 AD for St. Procopius, approximately 304 to 311 for St. Cyrus and John. Okay. And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, so they had made an image of the cross before which with their faces turned to the east, they adored the Lord Jesus Christ seven times a day. Okay. So uh, that's the post Nicene attestation to pre-Nicene practice. Um, now, moving on to enemy attestation. This is a bit of a tricky category, but I think it serves a very strong corroborating role. And so I, first, I want to talk about just the relevance of it, the relevance of non-Christian hostile attestation about Christian worship practices. The first um, thing to consider is that obviously, um, we can be we can expect that enemies of Christianity 
uh, or rather we should say non-Christians who are hostile as opposed to as though we're, you know, we view them as enemies or something. Um, these uh, sources can be expected to construe Christian worship negatively. Um, you can also expect a degree of ignorance or dishonesty that can vary from source to source. You would expect the enemies to basically be incentivized to portray Christians as differently as they could get away with. It's more likely that they are being honest if their descriptions admit to anything that would look remotely similar to how they, the enemies, would worship. So basically, if they ever portray Christians as doing anything that looks remotely like what they would do, it's a concession that they're being held to because they can't deny the fact that everyone kind of knows that Christians do something that looks sort of like this. If they would, if they could deny it, they would. Um, and the fact that they can't um, strongly suggests that they're being accurate in what they're admitting. A similar kind of logic is often used in apologetics related to the resurrection and the New Testament. The, the role that enemy attestation plays uh, can be like rather significant in those contexts. And so I would apply it in a very similar manner here. Now, while one enemy source saying something may just be like a blip on the radar, if there's consensus across different locales, like different places in the Mediterranean world and different kinds of enemies, um, as opposed to sort of like people that all sort of have the same background and might be sort of sharing information, this would be more likely to reflect an approximation of the truth. So basically, if you have uh, Jews, Romans, and Gnostics all saying, those Christians, they do something that looks like, you know, bowing to images or something like that. That would be different than if you just have like one Roman source that seems to portray that. So the first source is the Acts of John. And this is a docetic Gnostic source from the second or third century AD. Some people will put it in the first century. I don't personally buy that, but anyways, um, the source says, uh, Having said this, and he's, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the context here is that um, there's a, um, a pseudo apostle John um, who's sort of a figment of the Gnostic author's imagination. And this Gnostic version of John, he basically, um, he does various things. And that's what the Acts of John constitutes. It's basically an account of all the stuff he does. Um, and one of the things he does very early on in the, this collection of stories about uh, Gnostic John is uh, he makes a convert to Christianity um, named Lycomedes. And he makes the convert by raising his wife from the dead. And so then they're both like, all right, well, I guess, yeah, let's become Christians. So um, here's the text of uh, Acts of John. Having said this in a sportive manner, he entered with him into his bedchamber. So the uh, he, here is John, entered with him, like Medes, into his bedchamber, and he saw there the image of a man, crowned, and tapers and altars, set before it on which he addressed him thus. Like Medes, what have you to do with this image? Which of your gods is it that is painted here? I see you still live like a heathen. So that's John accusing like Medes of idolatry. And like Medes answered him, he alone is my God, who hath rec rescued me and my wife from death. But if after God we may call men... Who have done good to us gods, then thou art the God who is represented in that picture, whom therefore I crown and love and reverence as having been a good guide to me in the way. John never as yet, having seen his own face, said to him, My son, you are mocking me. Am I so superior to my Lord in form? How can you make me believe that this picture is like to me? Okay. So, like Amidi's faith sounds more like a typical Christian. Orthodox, who believes in the goodness of creation. The description of the image veneration is surprisingly complicated and detailed. He gives an apologetic, basically, for image making that you and image venerating that uses Orthodox teachings, uh, monotheism, uh, the type prototype distinction, um, veneration as distinct from worship, and even some very nuanced stuff about human nature and deification. Uh, in that he still portrays John as a human while acknowledging his participation in uh, divine life. Uh, a Gnostic text would be very unlikely to contain an apologetic for icon veneration, even if it rejects that apologetic, if there was not an existing Orthodox practice and justification for it that the author had heard. 
So Gnostic John responds to this apologetic by dropping the accusation of idolatry and instead pushing the idea that the images we should focus on are on making are purely ethical images. You know, paint the colors of virtue in your soul instead of painting actual painted stuff. Um, <clears throat> And those who make physical images or venerate them lack a mature, purely spiritual perspective. So Gnostic John says this, but this that thou hast now done is childish and imperfect. Thou hast drawn a dead likeness of the dead. Um, this is only, of course, one time where we see this sort of anti-goodness um, of creation mindset in, uh, in the Acts of John. It has decisive and distinctive docetic Christology, which I'll bring up, you know, a quote related to this um, when we do an in-depth dive. But notice the the change from an accusation of idolatry to an accusation of uh, doing a spiritual immature, uh, spiritually immature practice that's too closely tied to matter and that doesn't acknowledge the deadness of matter. Um, which is exactly the kind of response you'd expect a Gnostic to have um, who believes in basically matter being kind of devoid of uh, spiritual presence and divine life. Um, exactly the kind of response you'd expect them to have to the Orthodox practice of icon veneration. So this is a typical Gnostic polemic against Christianity. And it's also reflected in other texts too, which I'll bring in some of those as well, that basically they poke at Christians for having these kinds of practices um, uh, they poke at Christians for having, uh, physical ritualistic practices because it's too, well, physical. Okay. So that's our first source. The second one is, uh, the second enemy attestor, uh, source of attestation is, um, the character Marcus Cornelius Fronto in Minucius Felix dialogue, the Octavius. Um, so this is written sometime between, you know, mid second century to mid third century AD. He says, uh, this is a Roman um, person, probably fictitious, saying, the religion of the Christians is foolish inasmuch as they worship a crucified man and even the instrument itself of his punishment. They are said to worship the head of a donkey and even the nature of their father. Um, and so this is interesting because he, as a Roman, is, is making the claim that worship is being directed towards the cross. Um, obviously, you can't expect him to get you know, sort of fine distinction such as veneration as distinct from worship, correct? But he has to be seeing something um, visible that would course that would lead him to make this accusation. Um, and then there's also a way in which this may attest to worship of an image of Christ as well, which I'll get into at a later time. Uh, a third enemy source is an unidentified Roman Jew referenced in Tertullian's Against the Nations. He also refer references this in his Apology as well. So this would be around 200 AD. He says, this character would carry around a picture directed against us with the heading Onokotes, meaning donkey priest. It was a picture of a man wearing a toga and the ears of the donkey with a book in hand and one leg ending in a hoof. Now, this description um, that uh, this guy has of uh, Christ, this description that this Roman Jew has of the donkey priest is interesting because there are some things about it that seem to reflect that he has an inside scoop on what Christianity is. He's Maybe he even used to be a Christian or was a catechumen or something, um, but he seems to be aware of certain aspects of Christian material culture that are very surprising if he didn't actually know anything about Christianity. What he's doing is attempting to mock Christians by publicly parading around a counter icon in an actment to dishonor Christ. Um, and this is basically a counter procession of mockery. Okay. Uh, and so this can, um, we can see this then as basically an attempt to uh, reverse and um, negate and turn around um, a Christian practice um, of doing processions with icons. Uh, this is just, I mean, I'm, I'm not speaking from a position of that much knowledge, but just at least superficially, it's interesting to me that um, the counter icon, as you've put it, um, has a book in one hand. Yes. Because that, yeah. that, I mean, how can you read that without thinking of, you know, the Byzantine iconographic tradition where Christ is yes. holding the gospel book? And even the language of the toga, it's funny because it's like some images of Christ early on portray him as the good shepherd. Um, but this seems to be witnessing to some actually kind of advanced iconography 
um, that we just probably don't have material records for. And that's to be expected because the Fayum portraiture uh, that a lot of early Christian, you know, imagery is uh, based off of in terms of stylistic, stylistic prototypes just isn't very easy to preserve. Only in Egypt would you expect it to be preserved because of the climate. And so it makes sense that maybe there, you know, it makes complete sense that there would be icons of Christ holding uh, the codex, um, the gospels, and wearing a toga as he's represented in Byzantine iconography um, that just haven't survived. Wow. Yeah. Um, my my uh, fourth enemy source is the Aleximenos Graffito. Uh, or Palatine Hill Graffito. I was worried I was going to say like Palpatine Hill Graffito, but uh, it seems I, I, you know, didn't do that faux pas. Um, <laughs> um, you know, it's the emperors. Um, so noting this image, there's a number of features of it that are uh, extremely important for our understanding of the cultural situation of Christianity in the Roman Empire before the Council of Nicaea. It is certainly a pre-Nicene image. Um, every scholar basically agrees about that. Um, basically, all scholars agree that it is um, an attack against Christians. The inscription on it reads, Alexa Minos worships his God. And the figure portrayed on the cross uh, is donkey-headed, and there is a slave, Alexa Minos, um, doing some sort of a ritual action towards the donkey-headed crucified figure. Now, you'll notice here a common theme uh, in the Octavius, in Tertullian, and here in the Leximenos Graffito, and there are a number of other sources that will attest to this as well. Um, there was this prevailing belief that Christians worshipped a donkey-headed deity, and this has its origins in uh, Tacitus, who describes the Jews being led by a donkey uh, out of Egypt, I believe. Uh, and so basically, uh, in in attempts to sort of lambast and attack the Jews, uh, Tacitus, the Roman historian, uh, he basically says, you know, kind of is portraying them as foolish and as having been, uh, ident as having started to identify the donkey that led them out of Egypt or led them through the wilderness as the God who led them through the wilderness out of Egypt. Um, and so there's a continuity here uh, and a, a reflection of an understanding that Christians are somehow a continuation of Judaism here as well, which is kind of interesting. So this is located on the Palatine Hill, and uh, it may have been, which uh, in the pedagogium, which may have been used to train servants in the imperial household, it portrays a slave with his arms raised towards an elevated crucified figure with the head of a donkey. And the inscription reads, Aleximenos worships his God. A nearby counter inscription reads, Aleximenos is faithful. The formal qualities here are very interesting because they resemble other early portrayals of the crucifixion, as well as later portrayals of it. And it portrays the slave Aleximenos with arms outstretched in prayer or blowing a kiss, possibly kneeling. Okay. My fifth source is St. Irenaeus talking about the Carpocratian Gnostics. He describes them possessing images of various kinds of material maintaining and maintaining that a likeness of Christ was made by Pilate at the time when Christ lived among them. He describes various ritual veneration practices directed towards these images and seems to make a distinction between crowning and uh, other modes of honoring these images after the same manner of the Gentiles, which may be a reference to uh, something that's more straightforwardly idolatrous. Now, this is typical of Gnostics. Uh, they love to lineage signal. It's kind of like virtue signaling, except um, they they love to basically like put, put out there in public uh, how they can claim credibly to be the true authentic Christians that have really preserved things. So Gnostics typically sought legitimization of their sects by means of strange, extraneous connections to marginal figures from the New Testament, like Judas or um, Pilate. And this is just one example. There's so many that St. Irenaeus brings up where they cl claim to have basically like se secret knowledge from Judas or something crazy like that. Judas, you know, handed down the truth about Jesus to us. Um, but why does having an image from Pilate which you are privileged to venerate, why does that make for legitimization of your religion? One-upping the simpleton orthodox and showing that, that we Gnostics, we're more Christian than you. Why is that uh, a legitimization of your religion if image veneration is alien to Christianity? It seems difficult to explain if that's the case. Whereas if 
the early Orthodox Church did venerate images, um, it's much easier to understand how this lineage signaling would function as um, uh, as a rhetorical device. So to evaluate these enemy sources, um, there's a surprising unity in their attribution of image veneration practices of various kinds, candles, crowning, exaltation, procession, prayer stance, so on and so forth. Um, the scholar Felicity Harley notes that mock icons work best if there's a recognizable image to mock. And Jas Elsner uh, notes that strong uh, there are strong cultural precedents at this time for mockery of a prototype image by means of dis defacement of, or sorry, mockery of a prototype, a person, by means of defacement of existing images. This is the uh, Damnatio Memore phenomenon in um, uh, late antiquity. And I'll go more into Felicity Harley's exact wording on this and Jas Elsner's when we do the deep dive. Sound like a broken record about that. Um, so the the conclusion that um, I'm putting forward from all of this is that it is more likely that these enemies are being honest if their descriptions admit to anything that would look remotely similar to how they, opponents of Christianity, would worship. And it does admit to external similarity by portraying some kind of honor being paid to images by Christians. All of these sources reflect um, when when under when you understand the kind of mockery that's occurring or the kind of critique that's occurring, all of it amounts to um, uh, signaling towards Christian image veneration practices. All right, my fourth category category of evidence is archaeological. And so before we get into specific cases of um, images that we have that would seem to have been venerated, um, it's good to establish that there is such a thing as ritual-centered visuality in the early church. Um, some of these examples come from an article by the uh, historian and scholar of early Christianity, Michael Peppard, uh, at Fordham University, I believe. He, speak, he notes the existence of an altar with four loaves on it. Um, and this seems to be basically a reference to the feeding of the 5,000. But the problem is that you can only participate in Christ's miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 if you offer the Eucharist on top of the altar, making it loaf number five. So the image isn't here. The images on the altar are in some sense um, open-ended. Uh, it's only completed uh, the meaning of it is only realized if you actually take ritual action and place the fifth loaf. Um, there's another case of uh, of this. There's a, a church front that has four wise virgins carrying their lamps. And the question, of course, becomes, where's the fifth? Um, that's almost an Aslan and Plato quote. Um, but you become uh, the fifth wise virgin, uh, virgin as you are baptized. So you basically... Uh, become the sort of missing element within the image. Um, and therefore, there is a ritual relationship that you have to the image. It is a mirroring uh, of what you are doing, and you participate in the reality that's signified in the image. In the famous Dura Europa's church, uh, which was destroyed, or rather, um, the town of which was destroyed in the middle of the third century, and which, uh, therefore, all the images in it date to before I think 253 AD, um, you have a, a chrismation area with a wall ledge for anointing oil vessels next to an image of David and Goliath, uh, which would make complete sense as kind of reflecting the fact that, you know, David is anointed by the spirit um, and the oil of anointing is poured in his head by Samuel. And that shortly after that, in the narrative of um, the books of the Kings, he then goes and combats Goliath. And this, of course, Michael Peppard connects to um, the way in which uh, there seems to be this understanding in early Christian texts that in the event of baptism, you descend into the realm of death and you sort of recapitulate Christ's own descent into Hades and battle with the hostile powers there. And so the anointing would come before the baptism, the descent into Hades. Um, there's also, of course, candles in front of saints in images of saints, uh, which seem to invite, invite and instruct placement of candles themselves. So here's some examples of that. Um, these are both, um, the image on the right is uh, 
probably could be post Nicene. Uh, I think it's dated to be after the Council of Nicaea. Um, the image on the left looks somewhat more primitive and maybe pre Nicene. Uh, but these are not kind of late Byzantine uh, images. Uh, the one on the right, I believe, is from the catacombs. And the one on the left is from a Christian burial ground in, I think, Israel. Could be wrong about that exact location. Um, so all of this shows a ritual-centered visuality in the early church. Uh, what all these examples have in common is a sense that the image is open or three-dimensional or breaks the fourth wall. You're invited to complete the image by participation. Um, and in this way, the images perform a cueing function for you to do some sort of activity. Um, they're not meant to be interacted with just optically, like looking at them, but to use a term that Peppard uses haptically by means of um, mo motion movement. And so then the question that naturally arises from this is, okay, so if we have all these all of these images in the early church that are um, uh, basically provide this ritual centered visuality uh, in which cue you to participate in them, in some participate in the activity being represented, then are there any images that cue you to venerate an image? And the answer is, it seems that there are. So we have a number of engraved gems from uh, some of them uh, certainly pre-Nicene or you know, based on the best estimations before Nicaea, others with probably prototypes from before the Council of Nicaea. The one in the upper left corner, uh, plate one, <clears throat> is believed to have been given devotional use. Um, but I'm not actually going to really dive into that one at this time. can talk about it more later. I'm more interested in plate three and five. Plate three is reproduced sort of stick figure wise um, or, uh, you know, given sort of like a, a sketch in plate four. And plate five is, re is represented in plate six. Now, these are images of Christ crucified. Um, and at first glance, you might say, that's very nice. Why, what's the importance of having these images of Christ crucified? That's, that's great that you have that image. How does this have anything to do with veneration? The images portray image veneration practices. So plate three uh, displays people processing towards the cross of Christ and touching it. Uh, or sorry, I'm, I apologize. Plate three appears to uh, might be portraying people processing towards, but might also be portraying people holding the cross of Christ and performing a procession, uh, going in one of the directions. Um, plate five has people processing towards Christ, um, towards the crucifix in the center. Um, <clears throat> these are not representations of historical events um, because the apostles abandoned Christ effectively on the cross as opposed to walking towards him or something. Only John really remains, basically. Um, so the 12 apostles who are being represented here uh, must correspond then to the church. And so we have here um, a mirroring between the ritual activity of a cross procession and um, the, the image of the cross procession uh, that is commemorating it after the fact. And so both of, both of these images witness, therefore, to a practice of... Um, uh, procession and exaltation of um, an image of Christ crucified. Um, another example of um, ritual-centered visuality that would seem to involve veneration of images is the Orant figure in the catacombs, which has been variously interpreted as an image of just piety itself based on the Roman context. Female saints the church as a whole, or potentially Mary, the Theotokos. Um, I personally think it's kind of meant to be a composite that sort of has resonances with all of those. Um, and uh, this image is a repeated one in the catacombs, and it appears in a modified form in the procession of uh, bridesmaids, um, the wise virgins with their lamps, in Dura Europas, who uh, do seem to have kind of a prayer posture towards the Good Shepherd. Um, but the direction of the hands and the eyes is very instructive here. It's upwards towards the Good Shepherd. And bearing in mind what we've said about the ritual-centered visuality of the early church, this can be seen as basically representing to you what piety looks like. What does piety look like when you're in the catacombs? It looks like lifting your hands up 
and your eyes up towards the good shepherd who is in the dome. And that is an Oran stance towards an image, which is icon veneration. We have other examples of Orants in the catacombs as well. And many of them, they represent this uh, uh, biblical passages that describe a descent into the underworld of various kinds. Um, <clears throat> there's, uh, with all of these, there's a focus on the idea of prayer leading to a moment of salvation is what seems to be represented in them. Their location is very interesting as well because these are catacomb images. They're in an underground burial place. And the figures are represented as naked, which uh, in most of the time, at least, which resonates with the idea that these um, are supposed to connect with baptismal ritual, um, which again, is, as mentioned, is viewed in the early church as this descent into the underworld, participation in uh, Christ's own descent into Hades uh, and arising out of it. And so the cueing here is also pretty clear. Um, what does it look like? What do you do? Uh, in order to be, uh, in order to uh, commune with God, when you're in the underworld, when you've descended into Hades, um, you look upwards towards the Good Shepherd. You'll see uh, the Good Shepherd being represented as the uh, the one towards whom Jonah is directing his Oran's stance in the bottom right image, and um, and this uh, shows us that the Oran stance is what you're being cued to do as an act of veneration towards the image and, and an act of prayer towards the one represented, Christ the Good Shepherd. Um, there's also an interesting significance that we can see in early Christian lamps. There were many formal lamp lighting ceremonies among ancient Romans, and ancient oil lamps can portray rituals and allow for participation in those rituals at a distance by means of lamp lighting. Um, Roman oil lamps can basically allow you to, depending on what's represented in it, light the altar fire, um, as you can see in this lamp here, which represents uh, a procession around an altar uh, by Roman maidens. Um, there are also other Roman oil lamps which portray all kinds of practices of various sorts that would uh, accompany the lighting of the lamp. Um, and some of them are uh, basically uh, a little not kid-friendly, and so I'm not going to show them here. But oftentimes a, um, a deity would be represented, and the light would therefore be directed towards the deity that's represented on the lamp. Um, and there are various formal features of these lamps that would also connect to their ritual use as well. Some of them kind of unsavory formal features. Um, there's a similar practice in uh, Jewish menorah lamps, which you'll see represented on the right side here. Um, the spout of some of these lamps is actually where the light would be coming out of. And so even after the fall of the temple in 70 AD, these lamps would allow for a commemoration, a memorialization of the sacred menorah of temple furniture. And it would basically allow you to light the menorah at a distance. Um, I believe all of these are taken from, yes, the Bait Nadif um, discoveries really uh of a like a roman era lamp workshop uh stretching from i believe the second or third century uh up to i think the fourth or fifth century but anyways this is at least encompasses some pre-nicene era um uh, archaeology this is cultic use of images it's a veneration of the temple furniture by means of commemoration now Naturally, the question arises, did Christians do anything like this? And of course, the answer is yes. You have Christian oil lamps that portray the cross, the starogram, Christ the Good Shepherd. You'll see that in the upper left-hand corner. It also has images of Jonah and the dove of Noah in there. Uh, fish in the upper right-hand corner. And Christians actually had um, a practice uh, that relates to this of singing, O Gladsome Light. Uh, as a pre-Nicene hymn for ritual lamp lighting. Um, uh, participation in Christian lamp lighting under uh, Christ as the light of the world is what we have portrayed here. And in this, there's this offering up of glory to the one portrayed. This mirrors a gladsome light. Therefore, the whole world glorifies you um, as you're lighting the lamps. Uh, and lo and behold, you light the lamp and you're offering glory to the one who is imaged. Um, and so here we have veneration by lamplighting and commemoration as the forms of veneration in question. 
The last category is epigraphical and manuscript evidence pre-325 AD. And here I'll bring up briefly the starogram. This deserves quite a lot of treatment on its own, but the starogram is this, um, it's this character um, that's formed by taking um, the tau uh, figure and the rho figure um, from the Greek alphabet. Uh, Greek speaking and uh, Greek reading people, forgive me if I you know, misstep here at all. Um, and it falls under the, the category of phenomena in early Christian writing called the nomina sacra. Um, and basically the nomina sacra is a continuation of the Hebrew practice of worshiping and reverencing the holy name of God. That's a commandment that's given in the Psalms, worship his holy name, um, by means of concealment, by means of uh, hiding that name and abbreviating it using only the vowels, for instance, Y-H-W-H, as opposed to writing it out in its entirety. Or, of course, just calling God name, <laughs> which is what it turned into in some cases as well. This is an extension. Uh, uh, you know, this is an extension of the Jewish reverence for the name of God by not writing it. Um, they would, uh, in early New, Te New Testament manuscripts, you see the words Theos, Kyrios, Jesus, Christos, uh, Nevma. I hope I got spirit right there. Um, you see these words uh, abbreviated. Uh, using just two characters and with a line placed over uh, over above it. And this isn't just out of convenience, since it, this wasn't um, it wasn't common to do this for other words. It wasn't also out of lack of space either. This is a distinctly Christian scribal cultural um, feature. Um, and one aspect of this phenomenon, which does not actually involve a name per se, is the starogram, which combines the tau and the row, like I said, um, in words in New Testament manuscripts for cross and crucify, and places the overline above this image. This is only used in reference to Jesus's cross or Jesus being crucified. Um, I think it's also used in reference to Christians taking up their crosses as well. Um, and the tau, of course, already looks like a cross. In the Epistle of Barnabas, late 1st or early 2nd century, and Tertullian and others connect it to the cross. But by adding the row, it introduces the appearance of a crucified person. So many scholars, such as Larry Hurtado and others, view the stargram as the earliest depiction of the crucified Christ, at least as early as the 3rd century AD. So 200s. Now, due to the visuality of Nomina Sacra, due also to the, the already established fact that the Tau was a visual pictorial symbol of the cross already, due to the fact that cross on its own isn't a name for God or Christ, and due to the unique, the unique use of ligature here, uh, combining two, um, forming a nomina sacra by combining two figures into one, which isn't typical. That's not normally how nomina sacra work. Normally you take two of the existing letters and you, they're the only ones that remain. For all these reasons, and given just the fact that the, the starogram just looks like a crucified person, it's most plausible to say that this is a visual representation of Christ. Furthermore, since it falls under the nomina sacra phenomenon, the contraction here, taking the word staros and contracting it into this, this image, is an act of veneration. It's treating the name of God as holy by hiding it. Um, and therefore, it is an image of Christ which is being honored in the very act of producing it. I'll dive more into that at a later time. Um, another uh, epigraphical or manuscript um, case of evidence here is um, the famous Grotto of the Anciation inscription. Um, I'm taking this, uh, this quotation here is from, I believe, the scholar Bigotti, uh, which is referenced in Father Stephen Bigham's book, uh, Early Christian Attitudes Towards Images. And there are a number of things that need to be unpacked about this and why um, it can count as a pre-Nicene witness to icon veneration. Um, but the inscription is partially corrupted. Uh, it par it's partially been destroyed. Some reconstructions of it look a little different than what I've presented here. But what I'll argue is that regardless of how you reconstruct it, there's some kind of veneration going on. And it seems plausible that it's image veneration of some sort. Um, the 
this attempt at reconstructing the the wording says under the holy place of Mary, I wrote there the names, the image I adored of her. Um, again, there's other ways of attempting to reconstruct this fragment, but um, plausibly they all amount to some kind of veneration, probably image veneration. And my last uh, type of evidence is just epigraphs of the cross or the stargram being venerated by adornment. Now this on its own might not seem that significant, but um, what we have to take into account is the idea that you can potentially honor an image by means of um, uh, how it, it, by means of the things that are inscribed around it. It doesn't matter whether you place the image first or place the stuff around it first, but there's something that's being added onto and put in relation to an image that gives honor to that. The scram here in the bottom left inscription, that is an image of Christ that's being inscribed. And so then in order to form this composite image with the dove and the olive branch and the, the laurels and the stargram, you, you add in this additional element of the laurels. The laurels, of course, being this honorary um, crown that's given to victors uh, in a Roman context. And so you basically have um, veneration of the image, the stargram itself being an image, being kind of encoded into the very composition of the image itself. Um, it's also interesting to sort of reflect on what sort of a mindset would lead someone to represent this. And it's hard to see how someone who thought it was wrong to um, crown a starogram, an image of Christ, it's hard to see how someone who would think that it's round, wrong to crown a starogram would think that it's okay to represent it being crowned in this manner. So this is another, um, there's numerous cases of images like this where there's some sort of adornment or crowning being given to the stargram, to the cross, um, and various other things like that, uh, that therefore constitute sort of inbuilt image veneration. So that is um, the response to Dr. Ortland's challenge to produce the uh, evidence of pre-Nicene image veneration. And so to review, we have various categories of evidence, pre-325 AD Christian author's attestation, Ignatius, Clement, Tertullian, Origen, Methodius. We have post-325 attestation to pre-325 AD practice, Eusebius and various martyr accounts. We have enemy attestation from before 325 AD, at least five enemy sources from a variety of backgrounds and locales portraying Christians as venerating images. We have archaeological ev evidence of the pre-325 AD church, the Orant, other Orants, and grave gems of the crucifixion, lamps and lamp lighting. And we have epigraphical and manuscript evidence from the pre-325 pre AD church in the form of the stargram, um, at least one inscription, and uh, various instances of epigraphy that adorn something that is recognizably an image of Christ or of the cross. And so in sum, icon veneration is not an accretion, but part of the practice and faith of the pre-Nicene church. And that's just the summary statement. Oh, it's, yes. it's... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm very excited to go more in depth on some of these. I think some of them I've probably gone in depth enough, but um, yeah, there's, there's plenty more to be said in defense of this uh, overall paradigm, this overall interpretation of pre-Nicene uh, church history. So um, if I could just, you know, ask you, I imagine we'll, we'll talk more about this in our future discussions, um, but uh, what is some of the academic literature you might recommend uh, for people who want to explore uh, this view of early church history and its relationship to iconography? Yes. So I do recommend uh, Robin Jensen's writings. Um She's a, a kind of um, moderate or potentially maybe somewhat progressive Catholic uh, scholar of early Christian imagery um, who's written a lot about this. And I think her views actually may have changed somewhat over time uh, or become more nuanced over time on this. Uh, I also recommend um, uh, Joss Elsner, uh, who's excellent, um, uh, his excellent paper, um, Iconoclasm as Discourse, uh, is very... Um, very helpful in this regard as well. I recommend reading 
um, early Christian perceptions of sacred space. I don't recall the name of the author of that one, but um, you'll see some of uh, his stuff uh, can pave the way for this kind of argumentation. Um, Michael Peppard uh, has an article on early uh, on ritual in early Christian art that I think is in the I believe it's the Rutledge Companion to Early Christian Art, and um, that's available online. Um, that talks about ritual centered visuality and gives some of the ex um, gives some of the examples that I used. Um, and then Felicity Harley McGowan or Felicity Harley, um, who specifically focuses on images of the crucifixion in late antiquity and who has been arguing over time for earlier and earlier traces of um, uh, the cross and the crucifix in the pre-Nicene record. Um, I also recommend um, Larry Hurtado's uh, papers on the starogram and its relationship to some of the images that um, Felicity Harley talks about. There's another scholar who actually pushes the dates further back than Felicity Harley in terms of the crucifixion gems. Um, and I don't recall his name. I'll make sure that that's included in the next presentation. Um, and then uh, I also recommend um, Bruce Longenecker's book, The Cross Before Constantine, which gives a, a good apologetic for um, the cross being a symbol that was present in pre-Nicene pre sources and which um, he doesn't necessarily directly touch a lot on the subject of veneration, but he gives extended arguments for the apotropaic use of the cross, which is relevant. It does bleed into the issue of icon veneration in various ways. Uh, so those are just some off the top of my head, but there's a lot of literature out there that, um, uh, you know, to go back to one of my points, that opens the doors up for um, acknowledgement of pre-Nicene icon veneration, or that actually attests, um, uh, agrees with the claim that there was something like that going on in the pre-Nicene church. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Michael. This has been um, amazing. Uh, I hope that uh, everyone has learned a great deal from it. I know that I have, um, and I'm really excited to continue these discussions. Um, is there any anything else you want to say in closing? Uh, no, other, other than just that I'm excited to go in depth on some of this more. And um, I think that seeing the kind of... Um, the thematic and theological unity between uh, the scriptural teaching about this and early Christian practice uh, will be really exciting and will make a very challenging case that I think is uh, is worthy of serious consideration by anyone who's looking for the truth about what Christianity teaches about images and who's interested in the question of, yeah, whether or not the Council of Second Nicaea was actually right in its decision, which yeah. it was. You know, it's actually interesting that you mentioned Larry Hurtado because um, he's written a number of good things on early Christian scribal culture, um, well, many of which you alluded to with the Nomina Sacra and so on. Um, and just one of the things that I think emerges from that, I think, dovetails with some of the arguments that Richard Balcom has uh, made in his, uh, well, it's an edited volume, The Gospels for All Christians. And, and what I think both of these things underscore is that the church of the first three centuries was a profoundly um, and intimately networked um, body of churches with a hierarchical structure um, and a process of transmitting tradition, um, which was remarkably, I think, well-defined. Um, and I think seeing the organic unity that exists in scripture and tradition and seeing the ways in which that organic unity is cashed out specifically in a liturgical context, which has a lot of theological implications, um, is, is just exciting. Uh, and it not only um, is useful in apologetic terms vis-a-vis -vis Protestantism, I think there's also something that is just intrinsically and profoundly beautiful about it in seeing yeah. the way that God works in the world through the church. I, I agree. And, and I would add to that by saying um, it is actually very surprising when we, when we sort of survey early Christian imagery and when we survey um, these devotional practices that I've been uh, arguing were in existence in the early church, it's actually um, 
it's actually very remarkable how consistent certain things are. Even the fact that in both Der Europas and in the catacombs, you have the good shepherd portrayed as kind of above and then Orants uh, below um, accompanying other kind of ritual centered art. Um, the fact that uh, there would be such a distance between Der Europas and, you know, I think modern Syria or Syria or Turkey, Syria, um, and then Rome, uh, it does speak to the high probability that what we're dealing with here is a fairly unified core of visual traditions and practices. Uh, so kinds of images and how you relate to them that would have to predate Der Europas or the catacombs uh, in order for, in order to explain that thematic unity very well. Um, and then I'll also add this in. I, I find it enormously beautiful and edifying to see how the early church, in the absence of any real distinction between the sacred and the secular, and any hard distinction between the sacred and the secular, um, or strong divide, um, living in this Roman culture that doesn't divide those things, found ways of gradually encroaching upon um, the darkness of uh, idolatry by means of kind of a conquest of the imaginal space, taking over the space of images by means of the incursion of holy images over time. Um, it's it's beautiful to see how things as simple as things that seem irrelevant to us as moderns, such as signet rings or lamps um, or cups, could become kind of the space in which uh, the kingdom of God pours into the world. Um, I find that amazing, and it actually forces me to take more seriously how I relate to the physical world um, and the amount of devotion that I have to God and, and how I view the physical world around me as um, the kind of template and um, sorry, not the template, but like the canvas on which the kingdom of God can be painted. Wow. And, and um, you know, this, that, that comment in particular uh, reminds me of, what is said in Zechariah chapter 14 when uh, the prophet is describing the ingathering of the nations in the messianic age. And it says in verse 20, and on that day, there shall be inscribed on the bells of the horses, holy to the Lord, which is the <laughs> words that are engraved on the crown of the high priest. And the pots mm -hmm. in the house of the Lord shall be as the bowls before the altar. In other words, mm -hmm. there is this outflow of sanctity. Yeah from the inner part of the temple where these things were once locked away and now the veil has been torn and that sanctity spreads out until it encompasses everything in creation until the most common of objects the bells on horses share the same liturgic or the share the same consecrated standing as yeah, yeah. the crown of the high priest the holiest piece of clothing in the liturgical system of ancient israel um but Thank you so much, Michael. This has been amazing. I'm super excited to uh, continue these discussions and uh, hopefully uh, these will constitute a uh, really productive engagement with uh, Dr. Ortland's criticisms and uh, will also be just a contribution to this discussion uh, more broadly. So thanks again, Michael. Thanks, Seraphim. This has been a joy and a pleasure. And uh, please see in the... Um... Please see in the description below uh, for a link to my Substack uh, and other uh, ways that you can uh, get in contact with me. Um, I'm interested in, in getting this out there more and uh, would appreciate everyone's support in that process. And um, I'm pushing hard for a production of, uh, of a book on this, uh, hope to, hoping to debut it sometime during the summer. And uh, we will be promoting that when that happens. So thanks, Michael. And uh, I will talk to you again, God willing, soon. Sounds good. Christ is risen. Indeed, he is risen.